Now, in an exciting change to scheduling, um, in, the, in the attempt to start a new seminar that is going to be working kind of all remote all the time and is going to be effectively time zone neutral, um, this does mean that we rely on everybody being able to sort of use Outlook calendar invites and uh, calibrate across different time zones. Um, and I think we have had a fail at that with Lily on this occasion. I believe she thinks that we're going to be meeting in an hour, whereas we're actually meeting now and we cannot reach her. Um, so what we're going to do instead, one of the members of our project has just done a talk at the joint sessions of the um, Aristotelian Society and the Mine Association, um, and she's going to be presenting that talk to us. So Claire Ben is a philosopher. Um, she's a research fellow on the Humanizing Machine Intelligence Grand Challenge here at ANU, um, and she's based in the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Studies. Um, and Claire, you're going to be talking about signaling virtue, I believe. And Claire, this is, we should all just sort of pause to acknowledge what a heroic stepping into the breach this is on Claire's part. Hi, my name is Claire Ben, and I'm a researcher at the Australian National University. And I'm presenting my paper, Signaling Virtue, Reassuring Observers of Machine Behaviour. So let's start with the problem. And to illustrate this, I start in a relatively unusual place, which is Shabbat. The Jewish holy day runs very roughly from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, and many different kinds of actions are prohibited on this day. Lots of them are prohibited de or writer, or from the Torah. Broadly speaking, there are 39 categories of work which are prohibited. These melachot include writing, building, and kindling a fire. In addition to these, there are many actions that are prohibited de rabbanan, or from the rabbinic tradition. These are often organised into four categories. There are those actions that resemble de orita prohibitions. There are actions that would likely lead to the violation of a de orita prohibition. There are actions that violate the spirit of Shabbat. And, and most importantly for the purposes of this paper, there are actions that would arouse suspicion that you will have performed or will perform an action that is prohibited de orita. Washing your laundry, for example, is prohibited de orita but the Torah says nothing about hanging it out. However, hanging out your laundry on Shabbat is prohibited de Rabbanan because it would lead people to think that you had in fact washed your laundry on Shabbat. Our second example concerns zebra crossings. So even philosophers would agree that it's prohibited to run over a pedestrian on a zebra crossing. However, this prohibition itself says nothing about how close you could get to the pedestrians on that zebra crossing. But there seems to be something troubling about stopping mere inches from the pedestrians. Why? Well, one explanation is that it's not obvious to the pedestrian, as the car keeps moving closer and closer towards them, that they have been seen and that you, the driver, are planning to stop. While these two examples seem to be radically different, they share some important common features. There is an agent and there is the observer of the agent's behaviour. There's also an information asymmetry between the two. There is uncertainty on the part of the observer about the past and future adherence to the accepted prohibitions. And there is a call for the avoidance of what I call miscommunication. There's a call that the agent make clear to the observer that they have and are planning to adhere to the accepted prohibitions. The only difference is, is that Shabbat concerns past adherence while crossing is about future adherence. So I now present a unified example of these. Uh, in the interest of getting unity, I have, of course, sacrificed some degree of realism. So suppose you instruct your daughter Lara, who bears a striking resemblance to Little Red Riding Hood, to carry a basket of muffins to her grandmother's house after school. But between school and grandmother's house lies a forest wherein lives a very dangerous wolf. Luckily, this wolf only stays within the confines of the forest. You and tell Lara that the forest is absolutely off limits. She is prohibited from ever walking through the forest. Um, here is a following diagram to illustrate the paths she can take from school to grandma's house. Uh, I promise that in the final paper, the diagram will be much more professionally drawn. So here we can see she's got three paths from school to grandma's house. A gives the forbidden forest a very wide berth. B cuts straight through the forest and is therefore forbidden. C is interesting. It follows path B all the way to the forest, then skirts the edge and then rejoins path B towards grandma's house. Now, <clears throat> because of the villages in the way, you only have two lines of sight from your house. 
It looks like C is the best option. It's both permissible and it's the shortest route between school and grandma's house of the permissible options. However, from your two lines of sight, C is indistinguishable from path B, which is forbidden. Therefore, were Lara to take C, it would not be clear to you whether in fact she was doing something permissible or something impermissible. So you might have noticed from the title of my talk that this was supposed to be about machines and it may not be obvious as yet that it really is. The examples I've given so far involve human agents, but we could easily imagine how a case like Lara's could be replaced with a machine system. And in fact, machine systems have a lot of the features that is common to all these problems. There's often a human observer of machine behavior, and there's often uncertainty on the part of that observer as to the behavior of the machine, especially about whether mach the machine uh, is going to adhere to the, to the prohibitions that are in place. This uncertainty can arise because the innate opacity of certain machine systems, or simply because not all parts of its behavior are going to be directly observable. It's also um, because we can't predict what a machine system will do based on what we might do, which is perhaps why we figure out what other um, human agents might, how they might behave. And so this problem applies to things like self-driving cars. The zebra crossing example obviously has direct application, but also to things like autonomous weapon systems. And in fact, any machine system that engages in planning. And the importance of this is that machine ethics has traditionally overlooked the communicative nature of ethical behavior. And that's something that I explore in this paper. So we've seen the problem. The question is now, what is the solution? Well, I propose the following principle, reassurance, which mirrors that de Rabbanan prohibition. Reassurance states that you should not follow a path that, at some point of observation, is similar to an impermissible path that there is some chance of being followed. So let's apply it to our example of Lara. So here were her three paths. We can note that C um, <clears throat> is similar to an impermissible path and therefore risks miscommunication. Reassurance therefore states that Lara should take path A, because not only is path A permissible, it is also unambiguously permissible. But we should note this kind of constraint is different from the constraint of not going into the forest. Here we have now two orders of constraints. The first order constraint would be not to go into the forest, and the second order constraint would say not to take path C, because it looks like you might go through the forest. This has two implications. Firstly, it gives us an indication as to priority. Were we faced with um, only B and C, it's not to say that e they're equally wrong to take. It is much better to violate a second order constraint in this case than the first order constraint. Secondly, it gives us um, some indication of how we might react to violations of these different kinds. And this follows the tradition where violations of de Rabbanan prohibitions are taken to be less serious than violations of um, de Oraita prohibitions. I therefore talk about permissible and forbidden in terms of um, relative to first order constraints and acceptable and unacceptable paths relative to second order constraints. You may have noticed, however, reading reassurance that as it stands, it is crazily strong, is going to rule out an awful lot of paths. But I state it as the strongest version of this constraint and note that it can be weakened and made responsive to different contexts, including different costs, risks and risk attitudes. I outline now three dimensions along which it can be modified. The first is likelihood because a range exists from some chance of being followed to more likely to be followed than the path in question. For example, we may not want to worry about those impermissible paths that are straightforwardly irrational to take. So take this modified version of, Lara, of the example with Lara. Here she has two additional paths she could take. <clears throat> There's D that follows path A and then takes a little side um, path in, uh, into the forest and then can join, rejoins path A and there's path E and this gives the forbidden forest an even wider berth. Now on the strictest reading of reinsurance only E would be acceptable and it's the only one that's unambiguously permissible. However, because A is much shorter than D, D is going to be irrational. 
This is under the assumption that Lara's preference is to take the shortest path. Therefore, it doesn't look like we should worry about D. And so, therefore, on a weaker version of reassurance, A would also be acceptable. Because if we see, saw, a, uh, saw Lara following along this path, we could be reasonably certain she's going to take A in preference to D, as A is shorter than D. We could also incorporate other kinds of information. For example, has Lara gone into the Forbidden Forest before in order to estimate the subjective probabilities of each of these paths? And then we could identify a threshold of acceptability. The second dimension is similarity, because a range exists from similar to an impermissible path to identical to an impermissible path. We may only want to worry about paths that could never be distinguished or those that could not be distinguished cheaply. So take our original example. Suppose if we take this point um, along the path, when we look at it with our naked eye, perhaps they look identical. But if you spent the time perhaps to dig out your old monocular from the attic, you could see that they are distinct and realize that Lara is on path C and not B. It is perhaps acceptable then for Lara to take path C if she should, if she's acceptable for her to assume that you would go and find that monocular. The third dimension is observation. As a range exists from at some point of observation to at all points of observation. And we also want to know that some points of observation, perhaps those when an intervention is still possible, might be more important than others. So let's look at this third iteration of the forest example. Here, Lara has path F available. Now, path F is, looks indistinguishable from path D, but only at the first point of observation. Therefore, on the strictest reading of reassurance, E is still the only unambiguous path. However, F is distinguishable from D, but only at the second point of observation. We therefore need to weigh up the risks of waiting until after the Forbidden Forest um, to tell whether or not Lara was truly on path F or D. It also means that it might be worth the cost, in this case maybe climbing a roof, if it would add another line of sight to gather more information, given that F is distinguishable before the Forbidden Forest, but not with your current lines of sight. What are the implications of this? Well, it has implications for machine ethics, as machine ethics, in particular AI safety, has primarily been concerned with how to make sure that a system can and will abide by the constraints placed on it, and how developers will know that the system will abide by those constraints. This is normally called assurance. However, it's very rare that we have ironclad assurance, and even when we do, it is often only available to developers. It may not be available or comprehensible to the users and the subjects of that system. My work indicates that in the absence of assurance, and perhaps even when it's available to developers, reassuring users and subjects of a system is still important. And this has three practical um, implications. The first is that reassurance will build trust in a system. It will mean that we understand and we can uh, that the machine's adherence to the constraints in place is communicated to us, and therefore that it's trustworthy and that we ought to trust it. Secondly, if a system reassures users and subjects, it's more likely that the technology will be adopted. And finally, human observers are often in positions where they're able to intervene in a system. And they're more likely to intervene if they can't tell if a system has abided by a constraint or not. Without reassurance, therefore, the system will be at best inefficient and at worst completely pointless as human observers um, will intervene even when the machine system is doing something permissible. But this has an important theoretical implication. The reassur reassurance, the principle I've outlined, mainly concerns planning problems like Lara's, but there's a much more general lesson to be learned. That machine systems should signal their virtue, thus the title of my paper. They need to communicate their knowledge of ethical constraints, and this might mean modifying their behavior. And this, had a radical, this has a radical upshot that even were we to finally settle on the perfect ethics for machines when considered in isolation, when machines are put in human-machine interactions with a human observer, the best thing a machine might do might not be the morally best thing, when the morally best thing risks miscommunication 
which is likely to happen in situations that are more uncertain. I take the term signaling virtue from signaling theory in biology and economics. This concerns communication problems of conveying the presence or absence of certain features like truthfulness or poisonous or strength between two agents when they're in a state absent of trust or sometimes conflict of interest and asymmetrical knowledge where the features are not directly observable. You can see the direct parallels to the ethical cases I've raised in this paper. The solution in biology and economics has tended to focus on trying to find a signal that is too costly to fake, as this is taken to be good evidence to the receiver of the presence or absence of the feature in question. The, the related issues of cost, fakeability and communication in relation to machine ethics is something I've explored here and what I hope to explore in future work. So the overall lesson of this paper is that just like justice, ethics must be seen to be done. Thank you very much. So one of the things we're focusing on here that's really important is that um, when we're trying to figure out what one ought to do, or how one ought to design and program machine systems, we don't just assume that they're going to, that we should program them in exactly the same way as we would a person acting in the same situation. And I wanted to sort of um, ask you to expand a little more on that. In a particular, like, you know, if you, if you think about the nature of that, um, that prescription in, in you know, Shabbat law, um, you know, one could think of that as being sort of unduly demanding on people. You might say, well, look, actually, I, as a sort of a, a person who's free at liberty and, you know, worthy of equal respect and all that sort of stuff, um, what matters is that I actually don't do the right, don't do the wrong thing. And if it looks to you like I'm doing the wrong thing, that's none of my lookout. So you might think that from the perspective of a person operating in that, in that condition, you know, Lara, because she's a kid, she has, um, you know, a certain set of obligations, uh, but a sort of a free and equal citizen might be might be entitled to say, I don't care how it looks. Uh, I suspect that that wouldn't be true in the case of machines. I'd be interested to hear you talk about how those things might differ. Um, yeah, so one interesting aspect that um, I haven't, uh, I, I didn't have in the slides, but is discussed further in the paper, is about um, the role of education when it comes to ethical behavior. So what's important, I think, for humans and especially for machines is that we often look at the behavior of others in order to determine what's right and wrong. So, so far in the examples, I've assumed that we already know what constraints are in place. We already know what permissible and impermissible behavior looks like. But if we suppose that we don't, then we can see that the communicative aspect of our behavior with respect to ethics becomes very important. So um, imagine that um, we didn't know <clears throat> what was right and what was wrong, and we saw ambiguous behavior. We might interpret it, therefore, in telling us that certain kinds of behavior were permissible when they're not. And this is a very important motivation behind the De Rabbinam prohibition, which is that not only would it make people um, suspect that you did something prohibited, but it might also persuade someone who was uncertain that behavior was permitted when it wasn't. Um, and we can, uh, we can see how that would play out in the case of machine ethics. If a user or subject of a system um, believed that the machine had done a certain thing, even if it hadn't, and that um, they may come to believe that that was permitted for the system to do. And human beings, uh, human observers who were in the position to intervene may not intervene when they then uh, have that behavior confirmed, like that impermissible behavior performed when they should do. Um, furthermore, if machines are learning from other machines, then the ambiguity of that behavior may become more of a problem, um, as machines may have the same problem that we have, which is to misinterpret impermissible behavior and interpret it as permissible. Thanks so much, Claire. Okay, the next question is going to come from, um, from Katie Steele. Thanks, so thanks can... Claire, you're a champion. Um, yeah, you sort of came close to answering my question just then. Um, so I was thinking of another, a way in which machines may not be analogous to humans when it comes to virtue signaling. So, I mean, for good reason, you were focusing more on the ways in which they are analogous um, mm -hmm. and you were focusing on sort of the observer. And I got the sense that observer was sort of somewhat vulnerable to what the, acting agent is doing and and 
therefore it's important the observer doesn't feel like they're put at risk by unethical behavior. Um, yeah, I think you were talking more generally than that, but that was this sort of uh, issue of virtue signaling um, that was coming out. Um, but I was I was thinking, you know, one thing people might say about these virt this virtual virtue signaling is that it plays an important role in reinforcing norms, um, not just uh, because people don't know what a norm is and need to be educated, but rather they know what it is, but they're not going to be uh, sharing unless everyone else is, um, and so it may be that. Uh, in our system of ethical norms, there are actually quite a lot that have to do with this sort of reassurance because we need to keep a critical mass of people thinking the norm is still in place. Um, so I just wondered whether you thought that was another aspect of reassurance that you might sort of rightly put aside for machine ethics or whether maybe it is also important that machines are joining in helping us feel like a norm is still in place yeah thanks katie um so just about that first point so it, it isn't that human observers are always at some degree of risk and that's why they care um or at least the kind of risk is going to be very broad because i include in that maybe moral risk that they are in some sense responsible, even if they themselves are not um, liable to the negative outcomes of unethical behaviour. It is perhaps like in, for a human in the loop, for example, then it would be that um, the output of the machine is somehow in part their responsibility. So I want to include an observer um, in that kind of relationship, not just one where they themselves might suffer the negative consequences. But in terms of the role of reassurance to reinforce norms, I think that is really important for human beings that we often communicate what the norms are by making um, them less ambiguous. And I think that can be important for machines. Now, of course, it's odd to think that we need to have um, this kind of, you know, a quorum of behavior and that could include machines somehow. We don't need to know that machines are not free riding on us somehow. Those kinds of concerns, as you point out, may not directly apply. However, when given our tendency to anthropomorphize machines and the fact that we tend um, to be in human machine teams, as that becomes more common, they, their adherence to the norms will still tell us something about how important those norms are. And if they can disregard them, it'll be easier for us to think that we can disregard them. Or the other uh, agents, human or machine, it's okay for them to disregard them. And so I think that um, this aspect of reassurance is, still does apply, uh, even, in, even to machines. Fair point. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks both. Okay, so one of the things that we're trying to do with this, um, with this research seminar, obviously, is bring together this multidisciplinary community. Um, so HMI, for example, we've got philosophers, computer scientists, sociologists, lawyers, um, political scientists. So I'd like to call on one of our computer scientists um, to ask a question here. Uh, so Hannah's got her hand up. Um, Hannah, can I um, bring you into the discussion? Sure. Uh, so um, it's, a, it's a nice talk, and thank you so much for filling in. Uh, so I'm actually curious because in robotics, we also have this notion of uh, selecting certain behavior of robots so that the, the other party, so the, the human, for instance, in the case of human-robot collaboration, actually knows what the robot tries to do. So usually it's called legible motion in robotics. Uh, and so the difficulty there usually is actually in designing the, the, the structure of the problem and the, uh, basically designing uh, what is the, the actions that will be good from the observer point of view and also then assigning uh, proper rewards and so on. So I'm wondering if you have looked a little bit into that side on how to properly assign the ethics components for these either reward functions or how to define, yes, this is good, this is bad, and things like that. Um, so simple answer is not yet, essentially. So um, uh, this outlines the 
uh, main problem and kind of the broad <clears throat> philosophical response to that in terms of the methodological change when it comes to our approach to machine ethics. Uh, I'm working on a paper with Alban, another one of our team, on um, what that looks like in practice. And hopefully Alban and also Sylvia and I will then uh, make, uh, actually try and solve this for a real, real problem. Um, but how we do that and what that looks like is something we haven't determined yet. Okay, sure. But we hope to. We have ambitions. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Ambitions are good. Actually, so since you mentioned her, Sylvia also has her hand up. So, Sylvia, would you mind um, yeah. your, doing your question next? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, um, <clears throat> it may be more of a comment and maybe a, a, an attempt to reply to Hannah than a, a question. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, this. <clears throat> this problem, uh, well, it's it's going to be a more complex problem than just finding, you know, uh, a cost optimal plan. Uh, but uh, the structure of the problem, from a computational point of view, maybe uh, my, my feeling is that it's going to be a lot better than you know solving a, a very expensive, partially observable Markov decision pro process. I think there is enough structure here to do something uh, specific to the problem, which is going to be good. And in fact, listening to the talk, um, I was um, starting to have another idea of something we could exploit to, uh, that would be beneficial to the problem, would be to model it as a multi-objective problem where we trade off the cost of the plan against the power of the signal. And then basically we would have the possibility to adjust uh, when designing a system, how much we want the system to be efficient and how much um, uh, we want the system to provide reassurance and perhaps give uh, humans yeah, the possibility to trade off between those two when they, when they design a system. I think that would be a, a very nice contribution. That's all I wanted to say. So can I just yeah. make a comment? <laughs> Sorry, this <Yeah. laughs> coming. <laughs> so, so in the in the robotics, the legible legible motion. Uh, sometimes they don't put it, or in many cases, they don't put it under the framework of partially observable mm -hmm. Markov decision process. Uh, and what's interesting is that they also combine it then with the observer uh, theory from control, which actually incorporates like what is the capability of the observer? Mm -hmm. so, so, so exactly like what you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. We, should, um, we, we should definitely have a look at this because uh, I think uh, we're getting the point where Albon, for instance, is already starting to think about how to, uh, okay. to solve this problem. So if there's already solutions uh, um, out there in, in robotics, uh, yeah, should have a look at it. it, hey, it might not thanks be very much. <laughs> yeah, and I, I wanted to say that um, <clears throat> modeling as a multi-objective uh, problem, I think, would be a really interesting avenue because one of the points, as I was making the presentation, is that we may want to weaken reassurance depending on the context. So when the stakes are higher, we may want to be more risk averse. When the stakes are lower, it may make more sense to be less risk averse. And it's not that there's ever going to be um, one one threshold or one um, uh, goal like where we have say this strength like this level of reassurance is what we need for every occasion is going to matter it's going to depend a lot on the context um, and that would that mod way of modeling it would hopefully allow us to have that choice and apply it differently in different contexts yeah for that guys i should say as well um hannah's project on sort of determining how to um how to assure pedestrians of the performance of um of self-driving cars may be a natural area of application for this um so the next question is coming from um jenny davis um the sociologist on our team um jenny if you wouldn't mind um speaking up so the camera switches to you you're on um hi everyone um and thanks claire uh, i've heard you talk about this a few times and every time i get another little nugget that i want to think about with you so um thank you for that today um so one of the things that kind of strikes me is just the terminology of virtue signaling. And I would hope, to, I hope we could sort of talk about that for just a second. Um, the, among sort of popular culture, virtue signaling has become a pejorative term. Um, it's sort of a, a, it's a denigrated form of um, 
social justice practice, essentially, if you sort of think about how it's used in popular culture. But what you're telling us here is that virtue signaling can be really useful in machine ethics. Um, to what extent do we think that lesson from machine ethics, virtue signaling is good rather than to be degraded? Uh, to what extent does that translate to um, how we should potentially rethink virtue signaling as a valuable versus um, troubling or, or uh, weak form of, of social justice practice? So um, it's something that I didn't have time to go into in, in this presentation, but in the, in the paper I discuss in a bit more detail, which is yes. So the term virtue signaling has a pejorative use. And so normally it's picking out acts that are conspicuous, though often impotent demonstrations of holding certain values. So this is people saying, you know, changing your profile picture to support Black Lives Matter or signing an online petition that will go nowhere. All of this um, communicates a value, but does so in a way that it doesn't actually affect any change. But what's interestingly it, interesting is that if you actually look at what the problem behind it is, it's that it is um, costless normally, right? That you are doing something that doesn't cost you anything um, and that tends not to have any effect. And this actually stands in direct contrast to virtue signaling as understood from signaling theory. And so economists would call like uh, what the pejorative use picks up on cheap talk, which is that, you know, it's, it's pretty much free um, and it's unverifiable. Whereas um, signaling theory, it's trying to pick up on normally um, acts that are, involve a cost mm -hmm. and because of that cost are much more honest signals. And so I've kept the term because of this very ambiguity, which is that it's picking up on something, which is, are we any good at judging whether a signal is honest or not? Are we particularly good at understanding the costs and therefore what that communicates? Um, what happens if someone doesn't just want to communicate, but they also want to cheat and the issue of cheating and fakeability is something I want to explore in, in further work um, because I haven't yet comp uh, contemplated what if the machine system wishes to reassure us, try and persuade us that it understands and plans to abide by the constraints in place while having no intention of doing so. Um, and I think that this, uh, the fact that virtue signaling is both used for costly, honest signals and costless um, disingenuous signals uh, reveals perhaps that we as receivers of that communication may not be as good as we think um, at, at taking the right lesson, like interpreting them correctly. Um, and oh, I know other people need to speak. Just, just a, a really quick follow up. I mean, I actually think I think that's a really interesting answer about the cost. Um, but I wonder too if we should just sort of rethink the potential value of virtue signaling more broadly in the sense that it that it could have an effect on sort of changing hearts, minds, and normative practice, right? So if we all, there might be very little cost to us all changing our profile pictures um, to something that supports Black Lives Matter, but when we do it at scale and collectively it becomes normative to, to integrate um, racial justice into our everyday practice. And so I just, I'm, um, I think one of the interesting strengths of your of your work, I guess, is um, that you're sort of pushing us to rethink uh, the values that that were already um, uh, existing values at play and um, the variety of ways in which we can enact change in the world. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it from that perspective. So actually maybe what, um, by focusing on the communicative aspect of ethics, including, as Katie pointed out, reinforcing norms, there is in fact the value even to cheap talk. Yep, even though it's costless, even though um, it's fakeable, what it does is it says uh, very publicly, here are the norms of our society. Um, yeah, oh, interesting. Yeah, I'll think about that some more. Thanks, Jenny. I mean, I think just to, just to add a little note on that, um, Given that we're going to be we're talking about systems that are going to be designed by um, private companies that are essentially looking to make a profit, um, there's probably going to be quite a lot of cheap talk around. Um, you know, if you think of someone who's trying to get a get a care robot to market, for example, 
Um, so having a, a good way of theorizing its implications is going to be practically very important. Um, so the next question is going to come from um, Elijah Perrier. Um, so Elijah is a PhD student um, in Sydney, as well as a lawyer and a general polymath. Um, Elijah, over to you. Oh, hi, thanks, Seth. And uh, thanks very much for the great talk. Um, and yeah, look, I think it's uh, a very interesting line of uh, research. My, my question, and um, you may have touched on this, and apologies um, if I didn't quite grasp this, but I'm curious as to how uh, this, this feature of needing to uh, cater to the perceptions of those that are going to um, observe the behaviour of that agent works in a uh, social context. So say that, for example, there is one person, so say that the agent needs to behave in a particular way to accommodate the what it perceives to be the views of one person, but then it has a perception that there's a second or third or social group where it, where those people don't share the same perceptions of what the agent is doing. In your thinking, how would an agent deal with the fact that there may be inconsistent views as to what the agent is doing among a set of people? Um, uh, what type of calculation would the agent be doing in order to to achieve its ob objectives in that case. Um, and you may have already answered this, so, um, but I, I wasn't quite clear on that point. Uh, I absolutely have not answered that. And it's a great okay. question. So thank you very much. Um, so yeah, it, I have given a beautifully simple interactive picture, right? Of one agent, one observer. And um, things become uh, exponentially complicated as we increase the number of observers and the number of agents that there are. And it's not obviously clear what we should do in those situations. So one um, approach would be to say, what is the goal of the reassurance? So is it, for example, to um, make sure that the observers who have the power to intervene do so only when it's appropriate? Um, so this would help us to pick out some observers as being more important than others. Or it might be, for example, that uh, in the case of self-driving cars, that you try and increase the predictability of everybody involved. So if a car behaves in a seemingly erratic manner, even if, for example, it's not being erratic, then that might encourage pedestrians to behave in an erratic manner. And that is obviously going to make then uh, have... Um, <clears throat> a reinforcing effect where then everyone else is going to respond to that erratic behavior and so on. Um, so that would be one way to try and find are some observers more important than others. Um, the other approach is to say what are the positive and negative impacts of failing to reassure different observers um, or for some people to be to find the situation more ambiguous than others. And so it might turn out that more vulnerable populations um, who tend to be more risk averse in general and therefore um, that's going to have certain negative effects um, and people who are more well off may be able to take more risks but that might also lead to a greater benefit to them so we could look at trading off the the uh, negative and positive consequences of that so that would just be two ways into trying to look at kind of uh, multi-observer situations yeah thanks uh, a more difficult question behind your question, uh, and that this is something that Alban and I have, um, I think, really struggled with and disagreed over, is the, that has not been discussed at all in this paper, is also the interaction between the expectations of the agent and the observer. So here I've been talking about how the agent should anticipate the responses of the observer, but there's also a question of what to do when the observer starts to anticipate the behavior of the agent relative to the agent's expectations of the observer and so on and so forth. So it's, it's not going to be a, a straightforward problem to solve. <laughs> yeah. These are, I mean, it's, these are such hard questions because, uh, you know, the, you know, as you say the the, the solution space becomes exponentially large in, in, in certain cases. So, um, yeah, no, thanks for that. That was very interesting. 
but we should also note that we as human beings do this all the time y yes okay. so yeah it's, it's not it's in some sense a, a new problem and in some sense not a new problem mm. i feel like we need some david lewis here um and can, some thinking about conventions um so we're gonna have one more question from michael then i'll ask um you, i'll let you claire i'll ask you something to sort of sum up um so michael yang um is a phd student at anu um, although he's uh, presently in um, in New York. Um, so, Michael, if you're around. Yeah. Or is your connection? Um, thanks for the talk. Okay. There you are. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Seth, and uh, thanks for the talk, Claire. Um, I think as we've had this discussion, I'm wondering about another dimension of that actions that might sort of explain when some states are permissible. Um, there's a notion in uh, reinforcement learning and agent exploration about reversible actions for states. So, um, you might think that one way to characterize bad states are states that are not reversible, right? So like maybe a car that hits somebody is not a state that is really reversible, right? Um, this seems to just be another dimension, I think. I, I, I'm, I don't know, I guess I'm sort of asking you on the spot to think about how they may be related, but it seems like an irreversible state is likely to be an impermissible one. But I mean, I think I can probably come up with situations where there are both permissible actions and permissible and irreversible actions and vice versa, reversible actions that are not impermissible. Um, yeah, so just curious what you uh, would, make, would make of that. So uh, that you, you were saying that there are irreversible actions that are not impermissible. Yeah, I just thought yeah. the idea about reversibility in general, like, do you think, like, how do you think, like, do you think uh, that goes to some way explaining I mean, maybe it's just another dimension about when uh, a machine makes certain choices that would be impermissible um, is that uh, they're also likely to be irreversible um, as well. Like the car that drives erratically is in the high likelihood of doing something that's irreversible. So, yeah. Yeah. And I suppose, though, um, one of the questions I would have is what exactly is irreversible? Is it the action? It Itself? Is it the negative consequence? Is it a negative consequence that cannot be compensated for? Um, and is it the educative point that's irreversible? So once a certain behavior is um, performed, it tells us something about the values of that agent. And even if you could reverse the negative consequences, it may be much harder to undo uh, that act of communication. So yeah, I think it's gonna it's gonna interact um, with this problem in an interesting way. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Okay, um, so Claire, just to sort of finish up, um, and if you have questions, um, if you still have questions that are in the Q and A, I'll ask you to transfer those over to the um, to the Slack workspace, and we'll keep the discussion going on there, so we can do a hard stop. Um, but for now, I wanted to um, just ask you to sort of put this paper a little bit in the context of the broader kind of work that you're doing at HMI. I think there's a really nice, um, you've got a really nice way of articulating the sort of um, how the, if you were to think about the problem of machine ethics as though you were designing these systems in isolation or without having to think about the kind of people that are going to be operating with them, with them, you design them in one way. Uh, but I know you've got a nice way of sort of thinking about the, uh, the sort of the two dimensions um, of how sort of properly thinking about work partnerships between humans and machines um, require us to kind of rethink that very simple model and I'd love you just to sort of close us off by um, by describing that for us. So um, my approach to machine ethics kind of mirrors the approach that I have to to human ethics which is that it's it's sometimes easy to think of human ethics as taking each of us as individuals these kind of isolated billiard balls that go about our world performing whatever actions are permissible and that's kind of it. We just have to work out which ones those are. Um, and while that's a bad model for human morality because we all have different roles, uh, we have to interact with other people who have different kinds of expectations and that should modify what we do. The same applies for machine ethics. And so once we consider the um, machines as something that we live and work alongside, um, then we can see how that interactive nature impacts uh, in two ways. So the first thing is that, uh, as articulated in this paper, it should change what machines do. So we shouldn't just take machine ethics to be this one thing we can settle on for all time. Um, it, it really depends on the situations that they're embedded in. 
and um, the ways in which we respond to them should inform what they do. Um, and the other aspect is that um, how uh, they perform in these situations may also impact how we understand our own ethics.